From the Toronto Star, I'm Sabah Etazaz, and this matters. There is a new contender at the table for awkward family dinners. Ironically, it's the very thing that might lead us out of lockdown and towards those family dinners. You guessed it, I'm talking about vaccines. Everybody and their uncles have something to say about the COVID-19 vaccines. In my case, mostly uncles. I'm not very up to date with the latest scary conspiracy theories to float on the family WhatsApp group. If I do try to explain, I met up with that trademark stonewalling of my South Asian heritage. Don't talk back to your elders. It's kind of hard to argue with that. AstraZeneca, Moderna, Pfizer, they've become the new buzzwords of our generation, but also the cuss words. They're saving us, but they're also breaking down friendships and families as difficult conversations crop up around the efficacy or safety or necessity of vaccines. So how do we talk to those we love about the V word? On today's episode, Maya Goldenberg, Associate Professor of Philosophy at the University of Guelph and author of the book Vaccine Hesitancy, gives us all a crash course. Thank you so much, Maya, for joining me today. It's nice to be here. Thank you. So as you trace in your book, the vaccine debate didn't just start with COVID-19. There's historic context to vaccines and vaccine hesitancy. Can you talk us through that a little bit? Sure. Vaccine hesitancy and vaccine resistance is as old as vaccines itself. We have literature showing us anti-vaccine movements back at the time of Edward Jenner. So that's the creator of the first vaccine. It was a vaccine against smallpox using the pus from a cowpox and inserting it under the skin of people to create the immune response to protect us against smallpox without actually the dangers of exposing us to smallpox. At the time, people were worried that there was something sinful, a mixing of species by introducing cow product into the human body. So they were worried about the religious implications of this kind of practice. And vaccine resistance has evolved over time, just like vaccines have evolved. And what's consistent about it is vaccine hesitancy and vaccine anxieties in general generally reflect the cultural anxieties of that moment. So during Jenner, it was religious fears about mixing species today during the time of COVID. We've got worries about, let's say, industry influence on healthcare. We've got immigrant communities and religious communities that are once again afraid of religious connotations. For example, are the products of the COVID vaccines halal or are there products out there not supposed to eat or consume due to their religion? So you can see how vaccines get tacked onto all kinds of other broader social concerns. Right. So there's like a whole umbrella of concerns that vaccine hesitancy could fall under. So in your research, what I see, it seems like what essentially causes vaccine hesitancy is uncertainty or an element of fear. And this is not just limited to these new COVID-19 vaccines. In my country, we still have an anti-vaccine movement against the polio vaccine, unfortunately. So can you talk a little bit more to what are the contributing factors to vaccine hesitancy? You did talk about public confidence issues with scientific research and some scandals within the industry itself, right? Right. So all is not well with public trust concerning scientific institutions. So that is a major theme of vaccine hesitancy. So my research was on pediatric vaccines. So concerns about, I think, measles, mumps, rubella is probably the one that's gotten the most attention in recent years. And I was looking specifically at vaccine hesitancy among people in industrialized nations. It would be too broad to try to generalize it to everywhere. And what we see when you look at the qualitative research where there's a lot of research asking parents, what is it about vaccines that make you hesitate? Why are you not convinced by the strong scientific consensus on pediatric vaccines? And they will often point to industry influence in healthcare. We have had past scandals and we don't know if, let's say, their child will be caught up in the next one. So there's this worry that science and scientific research is not always done with the public interest in mind. Instead, it's serving the interests of power, which could be government or corporate power. It's really important that you mention sort of this trust element. We've seen a lot of tragedies and reckonings unfold during this pandemic as well. And we've seen how racialized communities have been disproportionately affected by COVID. And as you also mentioned in your book, there is a history of mistrust between marginalized groups and the healthcare system specifically. How does that fit into this and how do we address it? 
Well, what happens when there is mistrust between, let's say, a community and expert sources, whether that's the healthcare system or public health, is it creates this epistemic vacuum. And what that means is there is an inability to get reliable information when you don't trust what are supposed to be the reliable sources of information. So when you've got, let's say, a community that doesn't trust the authoritative sources, let's say Public Health Agency of Canada could be an example of that, it gets filled in by misinformation, conspiracy theories, even active disinformation. So we've seen this around pediatric vaccines. Now we're seeing it around COVID too, that there is targeting of cultural groups that are generally not trusting and they bring in methods messages that sort of provoke the kind of fear. So things like whether the COVID vaccines are halal or whether there's beef products in the vaccines, it makes certain communities vulnerable to misinformation. We are seeing that now and we've seen that prior with pediatric vaccines too. And I understand it might be hard to quantify this, Maya, but what have you found? Most of the root causes of vaccine hesitancy, do they stem essentially from not having enough information on the science, being anti-science, or is it mistrust? How would you assess? I would assess it as mistrust. There is a pervasive idea that it's got to do with scientific misunderstanding. This was certainly the case when I was researching pediatric vaccines, that there's this persistent idea that it must be that they don't understand the science. And if they did understand the science, they would surely vaccinate their children or vaccinate themselves, depending on the vaccine we're talking about. And at surface level, there is some evidence that seems to support that view. You know, when parents say things like vaccines aren't safe, vaccines aren't effective or vaccines aren't necessary, they seem to be contradicting the scientific consensus on vaccines. So you say, well, there must be something they don't understand. But when you dig a little deeper, you start to see that it's not a misunderstanding problem. And I say this because I looked at how it is that people incorporate scientific information into their lives. It is not a purely cognitive exercise where you read the science, you understand the science, and then you vaccinate. Instead, we bring in a lot of things to understand science, to inform everyday decisions, not just about vaccines. Even questions like, do I take an umbrella with me when I leave the house today is informed by scientific experts. So when we incorporate that information, we do look at the data, we might look at the arguments, but most of what we do is look to people that we trust to help us filter that information. We look to experts all the time. The term for that is epistemic trust. A lot of what we know is determined by who we trust as informational sources. So when you've got people or pockets of a population that don't trust the expert sources, well, then their reasoning is going to go in all kinds of directions. And that's what we're seeing here. So even that explanation, so back to your question, is it scientific misunderstanding? No, it's a lack of trust. And that can create the scientific misunderstanding or the unwillingness to accept what might be very good and trustworthy the scientific directives. And I'm very glad you brought up Parents Maya because I wanted to get into the dynamics of it. This whole vaccine debate has created a lot of fraught dynamics, let's say, between families. I have a friend whose parents back home, they just keep making excuses to not have to get vaccinated. One time it was allergic reactions and sometimes they take the traditional South Asian sort of emotional approach and say they're too old to actually need it. And they keep having these conversations over and over and it gets really frustrating for both parties. So how do we keep talking about this? Because it's very important without it getting to both sides. It is very easy for these conversations to get tense, partly because we are all very tense right now. We are living in stressful times and there are things that we really want to do, including keeping our family members safe. There is no perfect way to convince people. In fact, some people may never be convinced to get the vaccine. But we do know there is communications research largely into how physicians should be talking to vaccine-hesitant parents. So I can draw on that to say how we should be having personal conversations with family. And it needs to start from a point of understanding and patience. So don't show up ready to convince. And also don't show up with a stack of papers or links to show them to prove your point. Anything throwing facts that people seems to make people defensive because they feel like you're not really listening to them. The more compassionate approach is to listen to what people's fears are and try to address those fears. Sometimes those fears stem from informational problems. You can try to address those. Sometimes they just stem from the anxiety over the uncertainty of it all. We don't know everything about these COVID vaccines. We know quite a bit. The information is looking good so far, but that's not enough to convince everyone. So better to acknowledge the uncertainty 
uncertainty rather than what we might be tempted to try to minimize their uncertainty or their fear and say, really, that's not really important, is it? It may not be important for you, but it probably is for them. So one of the most effective things that physicians report, because they're the ones often talking to vaccine hesitant parents, is you start the conversation with some common ground, something like, we all want what is best for our kids. And by just saying that, it brings you together as equals. It also recognizes the other as an agent and as a qualified decision maker, rather than trying to minimize them as here, you'd better listen to what I have to say, because you're either over emotional or old or whatever it is that we make people feel when we disagree with them. So unfortunately, the answer is do it kindly. I said, unfortunately, no, that isn't unfortunate. But the unfortunate part is it can be hard when we feel impatient and it isn't guaranteed to change minds. But what it might do is break down some of the defenses so that they can at least hear you and maybe see you as a trustworthy source and say, there's something about my daughter or my friend. They understand me and they listen to my needs and they respect me, yet they disagree with me. And maybe I want to hear what they have to say and why they disagree. And it might make them open to different points of view. We'll be right back. For a lot of people whose older family members, parents or grandparents who might be vaccine hesitant, these refusals can also feel very emotional to them. And many people have put off seeing family for months out of caution for their health, and now they're feeling helpless at the reluctance of their loved ones. So how does someone in that situation navigate their own mental and emotional reactions, first of all? That is a good question. I mean, one would be to take stock of your emotional reactions and say, what is it about this that upsets me? So sometimes our are upset over, let's say, a family member's refusal to get vaccines might have more to do with ourselves. Let's say we miss our parents and we see their vaccination as the ticket to seeing each other again. And the parents may not see it that way. So it's worth checking in on yourself figuring out what your own concerns are. And either you have to adjust based on that, or you might want to share it with the person you're talking to. If it's coming from a point of love, it's worth sharing. They might actually appreciate it, even if you disagree with each other. And you mentioned the fact that it's very important to not let the other parties feel defensive or up against the wall. And also to understand, I think for a lot of people, vaccine hesitancy might not extend actually to all vaccines. And it's in fact the newness of the COVID-19 vaccine and the rapidly changing news around it that might be concerning. So perhaps some empathy regarding that could be helpful. How do we talk about the science and the safety of these particular vaccines in order to try and alleviate these fears, but also not make anyone too defensive, like we're being patronizing or condescending? That's a good question. I'd say you try to be up to date on what we know and share that, but also recognize that what we know is not everything. We can talk about what the clinical trials showed us, but an educated news consumer might know that clinical trials don't show us everything. It's usually fairly short term. So you want to acknowledge things like we don't have the long term data. And how do we manage that decision given that we don't know what happens in 10 or 20 or 30 years? We also might talk about the difference between what came out of the clinical trials and also now what we're seeing on the ground. There's actually really positive accounts coming out of countries that have had large vaccination programs. There were a lot of eyes on Israel for a while about, you know, the extent to which they vaccinated a large proportion of their population. And they really saw rates of infection and rates of hospitalization going down. So we call that real world data instead of the trial data is obviously constrained and controlled in many ways. And that should be good news for all of us. But we still recognize that that's not everything. It might be our best choice given the uncertainty of it all, but it's not going to be the right choice for everyone. And even with the rapidly changing news cycle aside, there's also no way to monitor personal opinions and conspiracy theories floating around on social media. And in my family, most of my uncles and aunties get their information from WhatsApp groups, family WhatsApp groups. They come up with outlandish conspiracy theories sometimes based off of unverified sources. And that kind of just spreads. And I've tried talking to one of my uncles and his response was, no, it's on the internet. It's pretty much true. So how do we talk to family members, particularly a certain generation, about the difference between inauthentic and reliable information sources? And how do we deal with the WhatsApp news networks, quote unquote? 
I think exactly what you said is what you would say to your uncle. Express that you have concerns about where the information is coming from. And it's not a bad time to try to promote a little bit of media literacy, like do they cite any sources? Because when you read things on the internet that don't have a source, an academic or scientific source cited, it makes it questionable whether it actually comes from a reliable source. So we have to do it in a non-patronizing way, but hopefully in a helpful way, knowing that at least in this case, younger people have more media literacy than older generations, just because we've had more exposure and grew up with this very complex information landscape. There's been research about the fact that people might be more likely to trust sources that they're familiar with. Do you think there needs to be local and community-based engagement, perhaps, to help combat misinformation on vaccines? Absolutely. If you've got a people or a community that don't trust the expert sources, it doesn't matter how many studies you show them. They are going to tell you that they don't trust the source and that's going to end the conversation there. In fact, you might make it worse by saying, and this study, and this study, and this study, because you're not hearing what they're saying. They're not telling me I need 11 studies, not 10. They're telling you I don't trust the source, which is a much broader concern. There's been good work in Toronto and in Canada more broadly trying to address the kind of mistrust that some communities have with expert sources. So I'm thinking about the South Asian COVID task force that's Canada wide, where there's been recruiting of South Asian scientists, community activists and doctors to talk to their community about the COVID vaccines. And they can do it in culturally sensitive ways. They can do it in the languages that their community speak. And more than any Anything, people get to hear this information and ask questions from a source that represents their life too and are going to be seen as more trustworthy. Those kind of efforts are also happening within Black Canadian communities too. And as far as we know, that's the best way. We call it a local ambassador. That's the terminology now. It's the best way to address the layers of mistrust because an outsider probably can't get past that because they are in many ways part of the problem. A broader question to you, Maya. What do we need to do to address vaccine hesitancy in terms of do we need to approach this differently and reframe the debate around vaccines and vaccinations? Vaccine hesitancy needs to be understood in this sort of social context that I'm outlining here. There is still that tendency to fall back on, well, it must be a science problem and therefore we fix it with more science. And when I look at science communications directed at the public, both around COVID and prior to this around pediatric vaccines, it's almost entirely, here are the facts, let's bust myths. Myth busting is a big pastime online. Separating fact versus fiction, as if the congregation of facts are going to change everyone's mind. It's not wrong to supply accurate information. We need that to make informed healthcare decisions, but that does not capture vaccine hesitancy in its entirety. There has interestingly been a shift in media reporting on vaccine hesitancy around COVID that I didn't see prior to this. And it started with recognizing that racialized and marginalized groups were more vaccine hesitant around COVID vaccine, even though there was more risk and more cases in those communities. And that kind of created this moment where vaccine hesitancy was suddenly recognized that there's more going on here than scientific misinformation. For starters, this was happening even before the vaccines existed. So the lack of science didn't seem to be the problem. Instead, it was recognizing that the response to vaccines was part of broader social problems. And I argued this point in my book about vaccine hesitancy around childhood vaccines. And now there's a place where the consensus is very well established and very clear. But now it became more obvious and more apparent, at least to people that weren't paying attention to that, that we've got to think about vaccine hesitancy as a social phenomena that is tied into all kinds of cultural and social practices. So insofar as COVID has been this stress test on many of our social relationships and our institutions of governance, vaccine hesitancy is a reminder that we need to be addressing some of those. So you look at the sources of mistrust and you say, that's where we need to target, not with more facts and more facts and more facts, but let's actually address those sources of mistrust. Some of the demands of that are huge, but they are more than necessary. Things like creating more safeguards between industry influence and health research. The publics could not be clear about how uncomfortable they are with current arrangements. And of course, people have been saying that for years. Nothing gets done about it other than little things like sunshine lists, only because the people with power, the people with the power to change these arrangements benefit so much from those lucrative arrangements. Further, racialized communities have had problems with healthcare for generations. And when they resist vaccines at a time when we want them to get vaccinated, 
vaccinated, when they say, why are you pushing vaccines on us when you won't help us with all our other problems? Well, that tells us that there's problems with our systems around equity and justice. And that's how you get people vaccinated. You address those issues of equity and justice. Maya, you've given me some great points to bring up with my family on our next vaccine discussion. Thank you so much for your time and your insight. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. I was talking to Maya Goldenberg, Associate Professor of Philosophy at the University of Guelph and author of the book Vaccine Hesitancy, Public Trust, Expertise and the War on Science. That's it for today. Thanks so much for listening. This Matters is hosted and produced by me, Sabai Tazas, Adrian Chung, and Raju Mutter. Produced and mixed by Sean Pattenden, and our director of programming is J.P. Fozo. Our show theme music is by So Called, and our episode music is by Mike DeAngelis. We want to hear what stories matter to you. Please send us comments, questions, or ideas to thismatters at thestar.c. Please consider supporting the journalism the Toronto Star Newsroom does at thestar.com. And don't forget to subscribe to This Matters on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Let's talk soon. 